Hello, good afternoon. Nice to be here. And uh, let's have a discussion uh, about communication. I will give you a brief uh, introduction of what it is that actually we mean under communication and impact via communication, trying to lay out the diversity of uh, approaches, of formats that is available to you and maybe guide you to help to think about what is, why do you need communication and how uh, to do it. So, starting off with some uh, Eurospeak. This is an important document from a couple of years back when Estonia had the presidency of the European Union. There was a big uh, science event discussion uh, in, in Tallinn, which adopted the Tallinn call for action, which included several lines about communication, engagement, and impact. Yes, we need to talk about impact because this is where it all comes uh, down to. And, and we see that the document also lays out a number of keywords, a number of ways that can help you to achieve impact. Why we need impact to get public trust? How can we do it? By engaging people, by communicating, by developing dialogues, by co-designing and co-implementing. And the impact that results from this kind of uh, work in research and innovation uh, does uh, bring all of those benefits that we expect from research and innovation. So my first point here is to emphasize that impact can be quite a diverse concept. You might have be more familiar with academic impact, so how much a paper is cited, where is it published, what is the impact factor of the journal, etc., etc. So academic impact, valuable, but it stays within the academia. At this conference, you probably also talk a lot about economic impact. So what can we do with those innovations? How can we commercialize them? How can we build new companies and create revenue and create economic and social benefits for the societies? Also very important. But there is also the, the third dimension, the societal impact. Uh, how you can contribute to the society with your work as a researcher or your work as an entrepreneur. And there, again, the, the variety of things, how you can contribute, what are the pathways of impact, are, are several. Here just highlighted a few of them. Influencing policy, uh, improving practice or service provision, uh, legislation, altering people's behavior. You remember we had the pandemic we had crucial questions of how to influence people's behavior in order to benefit our all's health and well-being. So these are questions also for, for science, uh, not for them to kind of do research, but use their knowledge to help to um, kind of move the society in the right direction. Sometimes just Discussing things in public is also impact. Reframing debates, uh, helping people to understand concepts, looking beyond, giving the big picture, this is also impact. And capacity building. Training new skills, uh, new uh, understanding, this is also how can you contribute to the society. So we see that there are many layers, many dimensions of how research can contribute to the society. And one of the major ways how to do it is via communication. Coming down from the ivory tower and being in contact with the groups in society beyond this kind of academic world, talking to policymakers, talking to entrepreneurs, talking to people on the street talking to kids in the school. This is all communication which can 
and will have their own uh, benefits. So communication, science communication, research communication has become one of the themes which is uh, also very much emphasized uh, by the policymakers in, in science. So there's a few quotes from a range of very important actors starting uh, from 1985 with an important committee uh, gathering in UK discussing how to address the question of the gap between science and society. And they came up with a recommendation that it's clearly a part of each scientist's professional responsibility to promote the public understanding of science. So the message there is it's not something, communication is not something that you do when you have time for it or when it is fun for you. Actually, it should be a part of your job. You should integrate it all in all your duties, thinking about communication and thinking about how to uh, bring your knowledge and your results to the important stakeholders. And we see that there are lots of discussions about making communication compulsory as part of a grant proposal, this example from Germany. And again, this kind of general understanding that that science is not finished until it's communicated and commu communicated exactly to those stakeholders in the society who might be benefiting uh, from that uh, research or from that expertise. So this understanding is gaining ground and we see that there is both the kind of top-down uh, pressure for it by policymakers, by funders, but we increasingly see that there is a growing awareness among researchers themselves who really understand that in order to have impact, wider societal impact, communication is the key tool how to, how to do it. So what are the benefits of uh, communicating science uh, to the public? First of all, very important, it does benefit science itself. It attracts students. It attracts funding, and it also provides trust for research. Especially here in this kind of conference where we talk about deep technology disrupting innovations, we cannot expect that the society will accept all of those new innovations and, uh, and things that kind of science and technology are providing to them. We have plenty of examples to show that people might just as well reject them, not for rational reasons, sometimes for reasons that we might not be understanding, but uh, to uh, kind of prevent those situations, we need exactly to build trust, to build legitimacy of the research system so that there's a constant dialogue and we don't get into these kinds of situations where science is being uh, rejected uh, by the society. Then, of course, there are benefits to the society by communicating research, the economic and social well-being from all of the new inventions when they are put into practice or commercialized, but also uh, the, the aspect that I'm calling the democratic citizenship the important principle that we want our societies to, to make the best decisions in a way that the best scientific knowledge is being taken into account. And the process to achieve that needs to be one of deliberative democracy. We need to discuss all of the pros and cons and benefits and potential problems and then jointly uh, listening to the voice of the researchers, listening to the voice of the people, listening to the voice of the politicians, come to a joint understanding where we want to move forward with our society. So having good knowledge, expertise, knowledge as part of those discussions is really, really important. And the final aspect here is something that I hear from a lot of researchers when I ask from them, why do you communicate? They say, I'm publicly funded. 
I'm funded by the taxpayers, so it's my responsibility to actually tell them what their money is being spent on and what is the benefit uh, from, uh, from that. And finally, we also expect that from the communication we are able to influence individual, each group, each community, each society is able to make better decisions based on the, the expertise and knowledge that research provides them. This is a hard task. Uh, obviously, things are not as easy and simple that we just provide people information and they will start making better decisions. It's much more complex than that, but this is the ideal and aim that we are looking for. So we see that the, the benefits of communications are manifold, and each of these objectives is equally valid to, as a reason to do uh, communication. And here's another slide with further set of uh, potential goals, potential objectives, and, and, and principles that can guide communication. This is much more even specifically to public engagement, meaning the process where interested parties, groups, individuals are involved in, uh, uh, in discussing certain uh, research, certain technologies, and jointly deciding uh, where we want to go from that in our society. So a number of different goals there and different uh, principles, just to give you an idea. And uh, just to confirm you that actually the public is also expecting this from the researchers. So this is just one slide from a recent Eurobarometer survey asking people, should scientists intervene in political debate to ensure that decisions take into account scientific evidence? There were more questions like that in Europarameter, all indicating that actually the public wants scientists to participate, to communicate. Well, I must emphasize, yes, Estonia is there <laughs> in the top of the league in Europe, but Latvia is not doing uh, bad either. It's uh, above the EU average. So we have these expectations from the public as, as well. By now, I think we all agree that yes, communication is valuable, communication is needed, uh, it should be done. The difficult question is, why should it be me? <laughs> because usually there are not other people as qualified, as knowledgeable as, as you, as a researcher, as an expert of the field. Um, if you're not getting involved in some kind of discussion or, uh, or a topic, someone else will. And that someone else probably does not have a PhD in that field. Might not even have studied that field, but they have their opinions. And if they're loud enough, they can uh, make them very, very uh, heard. So we need to step in. We need to present the best knowledge to, to make sure that the discussions are the best quality. So I know very well that it's not easy for researchers to do communication. There are many barriers to that. Mostly things that how we think about communication. And I've heard a lot that why should I do it? No one will understand what I'm talking. No one will care. It's too complicated when doing, you cannot explain that. Or I cannot explain that simply. My colleagues will think I'm stupid. Or I just don't have time for this. I have more important things to do. I have my research to do. These are all mental barriers. These, these are all things in our head that uh, we need to overcome because uh, uh, if we keep giving those excuses, Nothing will happen. Communication will not uh, take place. And uh, in my experience as a science communication trainer and a researcher, 
I see that once scientists overcome all of these barriers, if they start to think, realize that communication is valuable for them, it can bring them benefits, those things fall away. And we have excellent communicators among researchers uh, just because they have found the motivation and then found the reasoning for them to do that and ignoring all of those mental uh, barriers. So it's largely up there. But of course, there are also structural problems. In universities, public communication is still not very much valued or incentivized, taken into account in evaluations, that sort of things. So this is definitely something that the universities, research agencies, all institutions need to address. And the problem is that we are still not giving researchers enough skills in communication. It is very rare that these kind of uh, courses and programs are integrated in a study of, uh, uh, at universities, in a PhD program. The researchers who are really active in communicating have told me after they realized how important communication is, they now think that this should be integrated already in the patchural level in, in studies. Everybody should be given the skills of communication really, really early on. And indeed, when one does, does not have the skills, the communication experience, like giving an interview or holding a debate or a meeting, this can be really hard uh, experiences and give negative outcomes if you don't have the skills, which then discourages people to further communicate. So this is why skills aspect is really, really important. And then finally, you know, coming back to those mental barriers, there are still a lot of unwritten rules in academia in what way it is proper to communicate, how much public visibility is uh, uh, accepted or tolerated by the, by the fellow uh, researchers. So again, some uh, mental aspects that are holding back researchers from uh, communicating. So we need to address these as well. And here I would really highlight the importance of institutions and the institutional support for communication. To have uh, communication departments at universities or research institutions, people who are specialists who can collaborate with the researchers uh, in their communication activities to give them this support that maybe the, the researcher is not able to get from anywhere else. So it is really important to have this kind of support as well. So it is important to think about communication and the impact in a very strategic uh, way. It is not enough to just have a public lecture somewhere or give an interview to a newspaper or give an interview to a TV or write a blog or post something on, on Facebook. These are all kind of individual acts of communication which in a very exceptional case can have a large impact, but usually it doesn't. So in order to achieve impact, we need to approach things in a very strategic way. The first level of which is to really think about what do I want to achieve with this communication? What is the problem that I want to solve? And uh, the more specific you are able to be with that definition, the better you are able to kind of design uh, your communication. So it's easy to uh, have an objective. I want people to know about my work or I want people to be aware of this or that problem. Very well, but what will people then do with this kind of knowledge or awareness? So we need to think about kind of more behavior objectives. What do we want people to change in their behavior or thinking or acting in order to kind of give impact to our communication. So this is usually the most difficult part. 
uh, thinking about what do I want to kind of specifically achieve so it benefits me, so it benefits the society. But once this is settled, once you have realized that, then you can move on to the next uh, tactical level. So who are those audiences? Who are those target groups who I need to speak to? And usually general public is a answer that is a bit too wide. You are, there is no such thing as a general public. It consists of a number of uh, different separate, more specific target groups and audiences. So for you, it is important to think about whom is it that I want to address? Are those the young people in high school? Are those the policy makers? Are those the kind of entrepreneurs? Are those the specialists who need to change something in their everyday work? And once you have figured that out, then you can start choosing your channel, you can choose your format, how to approach them. And then the final level is how to do it, how to actually do the communication. And uh, this is something which we will hear a lot during today's session, I see. So there will be excellent presentations coming up about engaging with media, the stakeholders, etc., etc. So, so this aspect, I expect, will be uh, covered uh, later on as well. So the possible formats, just to give you an overview or outline. The first thing that we usually think about is media. Indeed, that makes sense because media does have the widest reach in the society. We are able to reach, indeed, quite a lot of people with, by going to, let's say, the evening news, news in TV or being uh, published in the main newspaper of the country, etc., etc. So media is the obvious choice when you want a large audience, when you want to get your message out very widely. And usually it is a very good um, format or platform to reach um, policymakers. Because for them, media is still something that is important because they perceive that this is something that reflects for them uh, the society. But this is not the only option. There are other formats, other platforms available which might be more effective in your case. For example, social media. What is the uh, good things about social media? You don't have an intermediary, a journalist. You can directly reach your audiences, uh, give the message exactly in the way that you intend to without an editor meddling with it or anything like that. Uh, and you're able to have interaction. People can comment, you can respond, there can be a discussion. Well, that's the idea. It uh, doesn't necessarily always work like that, but if your objective is uh, perhaps requires these kind of uh, approaches, social media can be a very, very useful tool if it's used the right way. Or maybe think outside the box. Maybe we can use uh, fiction or artistic genres to communicate our uh, outcomes. In Estonia, we had recently a, a research project that was looking at the gender wage gap in Estonia, huge problem. We used to have the largest gender wage gap uh, in, in Europe. I think now Latvia has it. Um, uh, but when they had the research uh, figured out what might be the problems, what in underlying kind of societal uh, ways of thinking and, and practices, what they did is kind of they collaborated with a musician and produced a musical about it. And with a musical, you are able to reach quite different audiences. You're more likely to reach those people who are actually themselves affected by the wage gap and perhaps do not know how to react in those situations. And in this format, you might be uh, accessing them much more easily and giving them the advice much more easily than publishing an opinion piece in a newspaper or sending out leaflets. So it all depends on the, on the audience. Furthermore, museums and science centers, these days very active communicators 
in the science communication landscape. Museums are no longer just those pieces where, places where people go and watch things behind the glass. No, there are lots of events going on. They attract families, they attract young people, which means it can be a venue to, to reach those audiences and collaborating with museums can open again much more new venues uh, for you. And likewise public presentations, going to schools, organizing science festivals, uh, science cafe events, discussion events. The audiences, yes, in that, those kind of events are much smaller. Like here, we have 20, 30 people sitting. It's a small audience. Uh, but the connection that you create with the audience in these kind of events is much deeper. Uh, you can build uh, a more let's say, emotional connection with those people, meaning that this will have a greater impact on their knowledge, on their thinking, on their practices. Again, an example uh, from Estonia, there was uh, in the technical university, the field of uh, ventilation and heating was in real trouble. They had hardly young people wanting to come and study this uh, topic. And what this, this young new professor, what they did, they started going to schools. They started telling uh, young kids that actually this is the most important uh, field that there can be. Because if you are responsible for the climate of a building, you are responsible for people's health, their productivity, their well-being. So basically, this is the most important job that you can choose to do in the future. They went to many schools, many schools, and the kind of admissions rate skyrocketed. They had so much more interest, which they probably wouldn't have with a simple Facebook campaign or an ad in a newspaper or on the street. They created an emotional uh, connection. And these kind of uh, more personal, more connecting events are also valuable in those situations that I described, that where we have maybe problems or discussions that we need to deliberate or have a dialogue around certain issues in our society. We need to engage people. And this needs to be done face-to-face, -face, in communities, in small groups, listening, arguing, discussing, debating, deliberating, uh, but the impact, the effect in the end is much deeper, much more powerful than could have been achieved with other uh, methods. So this is why the engagement formats is the, the topic in science communication these days. This is how you build trust. This is how you build the deeper understanding of knowledge uh, about science, how science works. You can, you can do it with citizen science uh, projects, uh, with engagement projects, etc., etc. So, this is your toolkit. There is no one and only right format for your communication. It depends on your audience, it depends on your objective. This is where you can choose uh, what to use uh, for your for your objective. So to, to sum up, thinking about communication, having impact via communication needs for you to think about what's your purpose, who are your talking groups, and you need to build relations with those target groups. You just cannot just fly there and say, hey, I'm an expert, listen to me, you should do like that. This is not how it works. You need to build a trusting relationship. You need to figure out what are your messages to them. Select the formats, the channels, the timing, and be clear, relevant, and accessible. So the quality of, of science communication. And uh, in terms of quality, just to show you, I was part of a recent European Union project where we exactly tackled this question, what is quality in science communication? And as a result of that project, we came up with this kind of list of indicators, things that you need to 
or should consider when preparing uh, communication. So 12 indicators, each of them is important. So being scientific is as important as uh, being interactive or emotionally engaging the people or having the kind of uh, right uh, target groups. So many things to think about. And uh, there, this kind of list of indicators uh, and further toolkits are available at the Quest uh, website. You can uh, take a look. And uh, for example, there is kind of this short list or checklist for scientists to, when they're preparing their communication, things to consider, things to, to think about, uh, 14 points. A helpful tool for uh, researchers. And uh, finally, another project uh, just uh, started, uh, the Coalesce project. Uh, funded by the uh, Horizon Europe, aiming to build a competence center for science communication in Europe. So a center with is, which is aimed at researchers and institutions to provide them with the best available support to conduct communication, engagement, different kinds of uh, activities. So we just started, it's a four-year project, so the results uh, <laughs> will be a bit later, but uh, uh, we are looking for national hubs in all the European countries, so if anyone is uh, thinking they might operate uh, as a hub in Latvia, feel free to get in, in contact uh, with us. So thank you and uh, looking forward to your questions. Perfect. Thank you so much, Erko, for taking the time. And uh, we have about 10 minutes for questions. So while the audience uh, thinks about what they would like to ask Arko, I have a few questions of my own. And I thought it was a very interesting talk. And one of the sentences that really stuck out to me was that communication is not something you do when you have time for it. That you have to integrate it into everything. So my question for you would be, do you have any recommendations about how researchers and scientists can think about that integration and not just leaving it till you know the, the rainy day when I have time. I, collaboration. So I think it's uh, it's worthwhile to start at the start of the project or what else. Invite a communication specialist to sit down with you, explain what you plan to do, what are your objectives, and ask for ideas. You know, what do you think we could uh, do throughout the project? Not just in the end when we have the result, but kind of building the community and having uh, different kinds of activities in the meantime as well. And maybe kind of integrating uh, someone with these kind of skills and knowledge into the research group. So I'm not advocating that every researcher should be a very active communicator. It would be great if they do that, but it's probably not feasible. It would be definitely necessary for them to have the skills and understanding why communication is relevant and important. But these days there is a lot of kind of this practical work that can be delegated to practitioners, specialists, uh, and kind of, if you build up this kind of collaboration on equal basis with a communication specialist, I think that would be the best uh, solution. I love that. Let the professionals do it. <laughs> so does together together, together. <laughs> keyword. Does the audience have any ideas already that you want to ask Arko? Uh, we have some up here. Anda. Thank you for presentation. Uh, I have one question. Could you name some several your favorite examples of science communication? Uh, there are lots of great examples uh, out there. Um, I and I would do great injustice to, in bringing out just a few. Uh, I, I think. Uh, what impresses me the most are those researchers who actually do it on an individual basis, who, let's say, run a blog, have a YouTube channel, um, 
or are frequent commentators in media uh, in, in uh, very various uh, questions and can, are always able to give a meaningful input to those uh, discussions. So they are just not commenting on anything, but kind of giving a meaningful uh, input. Uh, and uh, un unfortunately, I don't know any, any Latvian examples uh, for, for that, uh, but I think all, all the other countries are, are doing quite well. Um, just a reminding, there's a quite cool YouTuber in Germany uh, uh, from a Vietnamese origin who really does kind of very cool uh, biotech or uh, bioscientist uh, life YouTubes. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, I think we had another question in the front here. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the heavy weight of um, mental barriers. Do you have any techniques, any quick techniques that could help overcome these? I'm a strong believer of internal motivation. So uh, in those discussions, we often encounter the suggestions that we should make it compulsory or we should pay people uh, to do that uh, or something like that. No, I, I believe that it just... Uh, people need to a bit reconfigure why are they scientists? What do they want to achieve? Uh, how do they want to change the world? And when, in, with the help of, for example, communication trainings and workshops, we help them to see that uh, how important communication can be in that process. I think uh, this is when the barriers start uh, uh, coming down. And another aspect that is really, really important are role models in, in society. So uh, in my research, I have seen having a, a leader of a research group who is very communication minded, we see that all the young researchers grow up the same way and initiate their own projects and take it very natural for them to be active communicators. I guess the difficult part is someone always has to be first. Now, I have another question. You had a list of different formats through which you can communicate. And there is one format that didn't make your list, maybe because it's too formal, and that is the peer-reviewed journal. And I personally have found that, uh, through my own research, found that the importance of having peer-reviewed journals is also very high and huge. And one very concrete reason for that is that in OECD's Innovation Index, the amount of peer-reviewed journals is a contributor towards a country's standing in that index. So if that's also a super huge reason to do that and advocate that. So Arko, I'm wondering if you have anything to say about this format specifically? Yeah, my list was for public communication. So this is uh, definitely a very important format for academic communication, but it does can play a role in public communication as well, although it's problematic because we know that the articles are usually written in a jargon, in a language that is somewhat difficult for other people to understand. And quite often they are behind the paywall, which means that they are not accessible uh, for, for, for stakeholders. Well, we have open access movement that is uh, changing that and we have examples where we see that people who are really really interested in some topic can actually are, are looking for those articles read them and become experts for example patients uh, for their own uh, condition so we see that we, we see that's a, that's an avenue but it's not something that I would recommend if you kind of want to have a large uh, public uh, impact perfect do we have any more questions from the public? We have one question at the back there. Uh, can we get the microphone? Uh, how often is good to post something like every day or once in a week? Like your opinion? So, so how frequent it is? To, how frequent would you have to do communication? Or what yeah, was what the was the question? How, can you uh, repeat? How often is good to post something? Oh. Uh, you mean in social media? In social media, it's all about community building. So uh, I think if you look at it from uh, those 
social market specialists who say how to build a brand for uh, companies, etc. They, they do recommend at least uh, every day to post something, etc. Et uh, but again, the posts have to be meaningful. Uh, of course, it doesn't make sense if you post uh, just uh, once a month something. It, you don't you know, build the followership. You, you need to be uh, pr somewhat productive and, and meaningful at the same uh, time. So I, I would say maybe uh, uh, a couple of times a week. It doesn't have to be every day, but still at least uh, weekly. Uh, and you know, this strategy, how to build that, how to do that, is kind of figure out what is, how can I build this into my kind of routine or, or a link with other activities that I'm doing. If I'm reading interesting articles anyway, I might just, well, post a link to an article with a short comment of why this is important or interesting, etc. Uh, if I want to comment on daily news anyway with my friends at the coffee, I might as well do that also in, in Twitter. Uh, adding my my point, so uh, I think you know, the the quantitative aspect is often not as important as the qualitative one, but it does play a certain role. Thank you, and I think we had one more question. Sorry, we have time for one quick question. Afterwards, feel free to catch Arko. You'll be around, I'm sure. Uh, hi, I'm from Rika Technical University. Uh, so my question was: uh, feedback is very important in a general communication. And in science communication, if we don't get the feedback which we wanted, are there any, like, I don't know, solutions? <laughs> Thanks. Uh, it depends on the, on the format. I think uh, quite a number of those formats are actually designed in a way that, that is not one-way communication, that you're just kind of disseminating knowledge, but you're also actively uh, collecting the input from, from the audience and uh, using that to kind of further discussion, etc. I think the main principle in any kind of communication is to respect the audience, to listen to them, uh, and uh, to kind of involve them in, in discussions in a, in a respectful uh, manner. I know that in social media, it, it can also kind of produce some toxic or <laughs> negative uh, uh, feedback or, or comments. We just have to acknowledge that usually this is a very, very small group of uh, people uh, who just want to make them loud and heard. So uh, we don't, there are cases where we don't have to kind of spend too much energy on that. But in other cases, I think it's also important to counteract misinformation and disinformation for the sake of other people who are uh, reading that conversation. Wow, thank you very much. The topic of counterinformation and misinformation, I imagine, could be an entirely different topic for an entirely con different conference. So thank you again, once again, Arko, for your time, and we'll give you a round of applause.